Hello, everyone. Welcome today. Hi. Um, so we're going to have a conversation about biotech in New York City, how we got here, where we're going, um, some lessons learned, uh, what opportunities you may have to take advantage of. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists to introduce themselves and give a little bit of context. I've also uh, I've asked uh, I've asked them not only to focus on what they're doing now, but considering we're at an academic institution, and many of the folks in the room are either students or graduate students, um, to talk a little bit about how they got where they are, um, where their career started. We'll just spend a couple minutes on that before getting into the panel itself. Um, I realized I should introduce myself. I know some of you, but not all. My name's Oren Herskowitz. Uh, I run the tech transfer office for the university. Um, which means when the faculty members here at the university come up with, and the graduate students come up with new scientific innovations, our office is responsible for helping to get those inventions, and we get around 350 a year from across the university in all fields. Uh, we're responsible for working with the faculty and the graduate students to get those inventions into the market and out of the labs so they can become products that help the world. That's basically what we're about. Uh, we also were involved in a, in a few different technology accelerators, so we run, uh, run or help run the New York City Media Lab, which you'll hear about later today, Power Bridge New York, which is a $10 million proof of concept center for clean energy startups. Uh, we help with the Coulter uh, Translational Partnership, which does the same thing but for medical devices. And we're also involved with the new Therapeutics Accelerator here at Columbia, which is an NIH-funded accelerator to try and get new drugs to market as quickly as possible to save people's lives. So that's me. Um, Karen, if I could ask you to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, thank you for having me here today. It's very exciting to be with you all. Um, my name is Karen Heidelberger. I work at Deerfield Management, which is a healthcare investment firm, and we have a little over $8 billion under management. We focus solely on healthcare um, and all stages of um, a company's life cycle. So, really, from seed all the way to very mature companies. Deerfield, over the past several years, has taken um, a foray much earlier than many other firms do. And part of that is because we recognize that institutions like Columbia have amazing science that's going on. And it is our mission to advance healthcare. And if we're going to be doing that, we think it's really important that we're able to partner with um, institutions like Columbia so that we can help get that amazing technology from out of the lab and to the patients. Now, we understand that that's a really long process and takes a lot of time and energy, so Deerfield over the past several years has really focused a lot on building up its organizational talent so that we have the ability to help scientists build their companies and help them also understand really what a, a good solid drug development path would be to, for that different technology. That's a little bit about Deerfield. Um, I personally uh, went to Cornell University. I graduated from the hotel school there, so doing something way different now than I ever thought that I would be doing. Um, but from there, I went directly to Wall Street and went to Merrill Lynch, which sadly is no longer really around, um, but was in M&A there. I did that for several years, and then I went to Harvard Business School. I graduated from Harvard, and my intention was to go back to Merrill Lynch. Um, at the time, the organization um, uh, really only promoted people that were producers, and M&A life is a difficult life, so I decided that I would take what I thought was going to be an easier route and went into trading. I traded at Deerfield for, excuse me, um, at Merrill for a handful of years with the, with the plan that I was going to be a great trader and I was going to go into management and solve Merrill Lynch's problems and be CEO and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, that definitely changed. I wound up um, meeting the head trader at Deerfield a uh, gentleman by the name of Jeff Kaplan, if you ever have the opportunity to meet him. He's very into social entrepreneurship, an awesome guy for people to meet. Um, but he brought me into Deerfield, where I traded at Deerfield for about 10 years. And several years ago, I've been at Deerfield for now 15 years. Several years ago, I moved into our partnership and communications role. So I have the wonderful um, time and ability to work with people like Oren, um, and we work together on different types of collaborations, but also helping on take that science that I was talking about to, um, to the patients. And if I think if there was one word, you know, we were talking a little bit about, you know, how you get to where you are. Um, 
And I think, you know, what always comes to my mind, and I said this back when we were chatting earlier, is that it's really serendipity and hard work. You know, I was lucky enough to meet Jeff Kaplan on that one day, and it really was a day that I met him for. Um, that it changes your life. And I think if you have to be able to look at different situations and take advantage of the opportunities that's handed to you, but make sure that you work really hard along the way. And, and just for context, how many folks work at Deerfield, roughly speaking? Um, we are a little bit different than your ordinary uh, venture firm. And um, as I said, we've taken the foray into earlier stage, so a lot of people think of us now as a venture firm. Uh, we have over 100, but Deerfield's organized um, not the way your traditional venture firm would be organized. So we have about 35 investment folks. Um, and then we have what we call the Deerfield Institute, which are topic-specific experts, and that's part of the talent that I was talking about that really helps scientists take their science from the bench to the patient. Um, and it focuses on very specific things, such as epidemiology and clinical trial design, biostatistics, primary secondary market research. So we're a big team, but we're not your average bear, really. Right. And you said of the eight billion or so under management, about a quarter of that is for early stage life science. That's right. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, John, maybe I could ask you to go next. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm John Cunningham. Uh, thank you for having me here today, Warren. Uh, I am uh, from Washington, D.C., actually. Uh, commute up here to New York every week. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm from Washington, but I'm not with the government, but I am here to help you. So I'm trying to make that little joke there. Um, I went to University of Maryland and I started my first company when I was at University of Maryland. It didn't work out, but it was something that I wanted to take the risk to do. Um, it was back in the early 80s. It was before internet, before everything, and it was actually kind of a video-related company, which led to the next thing, led to the next thing, led to the next thing, which is, you know, I, I'm sure if all that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here today. Uh, so like Karen said, I mean, it comes down to a little bit of hard work, being willing to take risks, and kind of following your heart, whether it works out or not, it leads to the next thing. So I've been in commercial real estate development for 30 years. Uh, I was a president of a company in Washington, D.C. for, I was with that company for 20 years. And uh, for 10, the last 10 of those years, I was uh, doing development work for Alexander Real Estate Equities, uh, which started in the late, or excuse me, mid 90s uh, as the first um, real estate investment trust uh, to develop uh, and own commercial life science properties. Um, I joined the company 10 years ago, and uh, now I'm a senior vice president, regional market director here in New York, uh, really pioneering this region. So Alexandria is the largest owner, operator, and developer of commercial life science properties in the world. Um, we are in all the major science clusters in the United States. Cambridge is, of course, our largest market, San Francisco, Seattle, San Diego, Ra Raleigh, Washington, D.C., around NIH. Uh, and New York is our newest cluster, which I think is very exciting uh, and very different than every other cluster where we are. So uh, what we do here is totally different than what my colleagues do elsewhere, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that some today. But uh, it, it's a really exciting place to be, largely due to the fact that we have great universities like Columbia here with tremendous entrepreneurs and great science. Uh, so when we were selected by Mayor Bloomberg in 2004 to develop the what was then called the East River Science Park, uh, we, we started uh, two buildings, 730,000 square feet, totally spec. The market crashed in the middle of uh, the, the, the development of the first building. And uh, so we had it delivered in October of 2010, uh, and probably the worst economic market you can imagine, totally empty. And uh, we were fortunate to talk uh, Eli Lilly into when they bought uh, Imclone to stay in New York and uh, really pursue what we kind of envisaged as a very exciting uh, opportunity to grow this cluster. Uh, since then, they've done very well. We've brought in a total of, I think we have almost 30 companies at the center now with about 1,500 people working there. Several of these companies are actually spun out of Columbia, um, some of which are Gordana's here, she'll talk about. Um, so it, it, we've been very fortunate to work closely with the community and have a shared vision that has really evolved into growing this cluster. Um, so again, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. And John, just for, again for the startups in the audience, uh, you also have a venture fund. Can you tell us a, br a little bit about the Alexandria Venture Fund? That's right. So I think we made our first investment in 1996. The company was started in 94. So in investing in um, primarily life science, we've done a few tech deals. I think Google was one of our first tenants in one of their first offices, funny enough, uh, which has actually worked out pretty well. Um, 
And so we have invested about $400 million into companies that are not our tenants. Some, some happen to be tenants, some ultimately become tenants. It's totally different. It's not dependent upon that. Uh, in fact, in New York, I think we've um, possibly invested more than anybody else over the last few years into early stage companies that stay in New York. We've invested about $25 million into New York companies over the last few years. Um, so this is something that we have a, a, a team of 13 uh, people, uh, PhDs, scientists uh, that do all the underwriting. We stay very involved with the companies to help them grow uh, and analyze them. But uh, that has actually led to something exciting we're doing here in New York now. It's, it's called the Launch Lab. It's a new incubator for early stage, seed stage companies um, that we're going to help try to develop and, and keep companies in Manhattan you know, within this footprint. So the Venture Fund, to me, our science team is, the, is really the secret sauce of our company. And they really understand the science. I am not a scientist. I develop science buildings. Uh, but our team is, is very involved in working with the scientists and, and really staying ahead of the cutting edge you know, ideas of what's out there. Great. Thank you. Cordata, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you so much. This is for invitation. This is a great panel. So um, I'm Gordana bunyak Novakovic. I'm a professor at Columbia University. Um, I'll start with my background just to tell you a little bit about where I came from and how I ended up here. So I'm a, a chemical engineer with passion for medicine. So when I graduated, when I got my PhD um, and landed on a faculty job in Belgrade in Serbia, which is my home city, I was really trying to find out how to find something in medicine where I can really make make a difference so to define my research field. And this search actually started in Boston on during one year when I was there on Fulbright and I was very fortunate to be at a place where tissue engineering was just evolving as a discipline. This was a very the very beginning. To be honest, when I came to Boston I actually never heard these two words together. So this was like the real, real beginning. And you know how it is in life, I mean you know what you want, but you don't know always what it is, but then you see it and you know, this is it. So this really happened, like this aha moment. And since it is now 24 years that I started to work in this field, and I've always been super happy about making this choice. So I spent uh, 12 years in Boston, and then now exactly 12 years at Columbia University working basically in regenerative medicine. And then more recently, in, um, in response to some of the emerging clinical needs, we started to be very invested into precision medicine, into developing new drugs, into building organs on a chip systems with human tissues that can help us de-risk the drug development. So here at Columbia, I'm um, closely linked to the departments of biomedical engineering and department of medicine. Um, we are on the medical campus. I run a lab with about 35 super talented people that range from undergraduate students all the way up to PhDs, MD PhDs, uh, postdocs, a uh, couple of people in the lab are already assistant professors in the, in the clinical center. And we are really all invested into developing new medical technologies and using these technologies to advance science and also to advance medicine. So one ultimate goal of all of us who are working in this field is really to bring some of these technologies to the patients, to the real use. And this actually made us launch these three companies that we launched in the last three, three and a half years. Um, Epibone, which is in the regenerative medicine space, Tara Biosystems, which is in uh, organs on a chip space. And then we have Ex Matritech, now East River, interestingly, which is a, a biomaterials company. So just to add one more sentence, what is really the most exciting component of this work is some kind of continuity when you have students postdocs in the lab, we all work together on something, so we publish our science, we file our patents, and then the same people actually moved to some of these companies. So there is this continuity which also generates a feeling of ownership 
this is like the work that you have done scientifically, you are a co-inventor on a patent, you are a co-founder of the company, and I think this is a very important um, <clears throat> dimension of all our work. So we don't advertise positions and hire people only, we are really trying to make room for people who are interested to move from the lab. And also some of our executives are actually a result of this, like over the years you talk to people, let's do something together, let's do something together, so we have quite a few, let's do something together as our COO, CEOs. And this uh, experience uh, of, uh, and history of working with people together really makes things very different than when you, we are not operating like as a company. I mean, it's somehow different just because of this factor that actually people carry over this uh, previous um, uh, history of research and uh, partnership and uh, co-inventorship. Thanks. I, because she's, uh, uh, too modest to say so herself. Also, please join me in congratulating Gordana. She was just last night, and it was uh, President Bollinger announced that Gordana was made a university professor, the highest ranked professor you can uh, be at Columbia. So. Um, Ewan. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today, Oren. Uh, I'm Ewan Robertson. I'm currently the Chief Operating Officer um, and Special Advisor to the CEO at the Economic Development Corporation. So just a, a little bit on EDC. Um, as the name might suggest, we're the city's economic development arm. Uh, we're actually a little bit unusual in that we're not a city government agency. Uh, we function as a not-for-profit um, and we're independent of the city's budget. Um, we have three main lines of business. Uh, we're a real estate developer and have partnered with a number of people, including um, Alexandria, over the years to develop the right type of space um, for companies to grow, um, start and grow in the city. Um, we also get involved in a number of large capital construction projects, so we manage about $7 billion of the city's capital money. Um, to build out infrastructure and different types of, of facilities here. And then the third leg of the stool in terms of what we do is uh, really all about partnerships and programs that focus on key sectors of the, the city's economy. So those are either sectors that are already large employers here, um, and we partner with leaders in those industries to figure out you know, how we're competitively positioned, what the barriers to growth are, and how to maintain and potentially further grow those industries. And then also looking at where the new opportunities are, where, where are our less developed and more nascent sectors um, that by partnering with industry, we can help to, to nurture and grow those. And obviously, one of the reasons that I'm here today is to talk about life sciences, which the city believes um, is a sector that has a lot of growth potential over the coming decade and beyond. Um, a little bit about my own career, uh, I spent 14 years of my professional life in London uh, before I moved to New York. Uh, initially, I did a, a, an internet startup back in the mid-90s through 2001, through the boom, and then that bust. Um, I then went to work for a large corporate um, called British Energy, which runs a lot of the nuclear power stations in the UK, doing technology strategy for them. Um, then did my first government job, uh, working in healthcare in, in the UK for the national government, um, putting in place some, some change management for the healthcare system there. Um, moved to New York in 2008, um, and I actually started my first job at EDC. I, this is my second tour in city government, but worked for five years um, under the Bloomberg administration. My first job at EDC was to run the strategy team. Uh, and my first day on the job was September 15th, 2008, which was the morning the markets opened uh, when Lehman went bust. Um, and so, you know, I was like the new strategy guy um, when the world was melting down. Uh, and I clearly remember going over to, to City Hall and sitting there with some very senior administration officials and people looking at me and saying, okay, new guy, like, what are we going to do? What have you got? And yeah, and so a lot of a lot of our focus and, and my professional focus over the subsequent time period has been on innovation and entrepreneurship, and in particular partnership with universities. Um, I was deeply involved in something called Applied Sciences NYC, uh, which led to a number of, of joint venture projects with universities, including the the new Cornell Tech campus on Roosevelt Island. Um, I guess in closing, some advice uh, for what it's worth from my career. Um, I think be curious, uh, be open to new and different opportunities and try and work with people who are much smarter than you um, because you'll always learn something and that then leads to the next opportunity. Great. 
Thanks. So I, I thought I might just set the stage. Um, for those of us on the panel, most of us have lived through this the last 10 or so years in New York City, but some of you may be newer to the town. So I thought I might just set the stage for where this was back at the time period when, when that Ewan was first referring to. Um, so I actually found out about this field from a, I was a former consultant at the Boston Consulting Group. And when I was at BCG, we did a project for the Bloomberg administration back in 2004, which had a very bold vision at the time, the, the, the Bloomberg administration, of saying, we are currently, we suffered through the first dot-com bust. Uh, things were still fairly fallow. And at that, that time, New York had one third of the venture capital that, um, that Massachusetts did, and one thirteenth the VC funding that California received every year. And yet the vision was, how do we turn that around into a startup capital? How do we make New York City build on its strengths and become a startup capital in all fields? So our focus was on bioscience, which is why it's, very, it's amazing to see how far we've come. In the meantime, as many of you obviously know, New York has become a huge startup town, primarily in tech so far, but also in media, fashion, food. There's startups everywhere. There's a thousand tech companies by the city's count. Um, uh, graduate students are, there's fierce competition for graduate students with technical backgrounds. There's over a hundred incubators and co-working spaces, lots of meetups and events that Google and Twitter and other big tech firms have moved here. We've had successful exits from companies like Shutterstock, Tumblr, Mark, uh, MakerBot, Huffington Post, a bunch of other firms. So the tech side has been booming, which is great. And I think what we're starting to see is a real momentum building on the biotech side as well. So Alexandria is full. Is that right at this point? Yeah, we're about 99.5% full. Okay, so there's a half a percent left if you want to rush and try and put in an application. But aside from that, Alexandria is for all intents full. Harlem Biospace is doing great right down the hill by Professor Sam Sia, who opened that. Um, we've got J Labs, Johnson & Johnson's Innovation Center, opening in town, sharing space with the New York Genome Center. Cambridge Biolabs is coming to town as well to open a facility. So there's finally real estate um, that has been created in town to, take, uh, to host these companies. We've seen venture firms from outside New York plant flags here in New York. So Arch, Flagship, Versant, Accelerator have all um, started operations in town. And the local shops like Deerfield and Lux have started to invest in local New York City companies. So it's amazing, actually, just in the last year, from Columbia alone, we've seen uh, Calliope, um, oh, sorry, Calliope opened in Alexandria, um, Kairas from Brent Stockwell's lab, Applied Therapeutics from Don Landry, and actually that one was invested in by Alexandria and is also hosted in Alexandria, um, with a combined $50 million in Series A funding from those companies alone, from Lux, Versant, and Alexandria, all in Manhattan. And then we've just on the panel, just sitting on the panel, Gordana mentioned her three tissue engineering startups that are all based here in the city as well. So it's really an amazing time. Go back just slightly to December, and we heard announcements from the mayor of $500 million more over the next 10 years, 10 years to encourage early stage life sciences here in the five boroughs of New York City. And in interesting timing, the governor also announced $650 million of funding for exactly the same purpose across the New York State. So that's $1.1 some odd billion dollars in funding for this field. It's an incredible journey so far, and I can't even, I can't wait to hear your views on what happens in the road ahead. But maybe let's start. Um, Gordana, so you've found all three of your companies that you funded, uh, founded in the last few years have started and stayed in the city. Um, why? Uh, I think because we could. Uh, when I first came here in 2005, there was really not much on Manhattan. And a few, few years later, there's components that you really need to start companies started to come along. I mean, first thing you need is intellectual environment and source of top quality people. So this is what Columbia and surrounding universities really give you. So we could always recruit people who are passionate about developing certain technologies. You need um, 
uh, help with filing IP. This is where Colon B is really great. It's unbelievably easy to file patents. I mean, you just give them information, they do everything for you. I mean, this is really to the credit of your office. Um, you need money because uh, when you come to the point using, for example, NIH funding, which is our main source of funding, you come to the point that you really have something in your hands. And then you become too far along for NIH to put more money into specific technology development, and you're still a little bit too early for any investors to take you seriously. And this has been described in economy extensively as a value of debt and in other ways. So this is actually where City started to step in in maybe 2007 or so. So we got some help from Columbia, some teeny tiny seed grants from Technology Ventures Office. We got some um, a funding from the city through BioAccelerate program that was instrumental for us moving ahead. We got some funding from Coulter. So these were all very modest amounts of money, but actually the ones that were totally critical. And it was interesting, like for the first company, Epiborn, when we got this first batch of money, the only condition I had to agree too, is we will stay here if you launch a company. And you know, at that time, it was almost like a science fiction for us to launch a company, but I said, sure, no problem, I live here. But then we ended up actually staying here because there was also this fourth component, which is you need home for your company. And these places, like now Alexandria, a little bit before Harlem and others, started to emerge on Manhattan. So it's just a perfect situation that because I lived here since 2005, I can tell the difference that uh, over the first few years there was almost nothing. Today it's just totally wonderful because you, you can live in a science hotel, as you like to call Alexandria, where you're surrounded by other startup companies and where you really feel as a part of community. It is not just a rental home, you know, where you have your company, you have all this. Uh, other partners around you, our customers around us, so it's just a very, very favorable situation. So this is why we stay here. I mean, why would you go anywhere else? If, if, if I can jump in and add to that, I, I, you know, I think Gordana hit it on the head as far as really wanting to stay in New York, and you could stay in New York, and I think you could stay in New York because there's so many great things happening in the city. Um, you know, our building the center was one thing, but you also had a number of great venture capitalists coming to town, already in town, people wanting to, uh, from the universities and medical centers who were creating ideas. Years before, it had always been everything got licensed and moved away. You know, someone would come up with a great idea, somebody from San Diego would license it, and they may get a check every now and then, or they probably wouldn't even stay that involved. Now people really want to stay involved. You had changes at university and medical center leadership that really understood the value of collaboration and the importance of having startup companies, you know, it's not only to attract great talent at their institutions, uh, but to continue to grow there, produce capital, and, and really, you know, grow that um, aspect of, uh, of, of the system. So I, mean, I think it's almost the perfect storm of everything that's been happening in the last seven to eight years um, that is really makes New York a super exciting place to be right now. I think there's also been a little bit of a shift because the science has changed. You know, we've, it's gotten just more advanced. So I think some of what you spoke about, about it being more difficult to get the early capital and you have to get it in little snippets, I think it's our hope that you'll begin to see a change in that and a shift because it does become easier to invest in that early science because the technology around it has changed, but also because, as you point out, the model has changed a lot and it's a lot more collaborative. So between the collaboration and the understanding the science a little bit better, I think at least it's Deerfield's hope that that uh, and our model is working towards a shift so that we can make that earlier investment um, in a really credible way so that the scientists can focus on the science and not necessarily have to focus on where am I going to get my next dollar from because you know from our perspective that's slowing down the advancement of healthcare um, and it's 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 asking the scientists to have different skill sets that aren't necessarily what they should be focusing their energy and their time on. Yeah, and I would just like to add, I mean, this is, this is a great point. It's also us changing. 
I think that this more effective collaboration between, say, bioengineers and clinicians and scientists is really teaching us about what to do and in particular what not to do. You know, sometimes you go to a clinician with your brilliant idea and they say, look, this is not going to work. This is not how we do things. So we are much smarter now than maybe five years ago about what to offer. Five years ago, we would actually present our great science. Look how interesting this is, and it is just science. Today, we have this ability to make the step further and say, okay, this is something that can really go into application. And you also uh, learn how to think about what you need, what are the resources, what is the timeline. Scientists hate milestones. Now, milestones are our friends, you know, you learn how to discuss. So I think it's both partners are somehow appropriate approaching each other, and everyone is a little bit stepping out of their zone of comfort, but this is a good thing, you know, we are really meeting at a, in, a, in, in a good place. And, and then I think if you take a step back and you look at that even more broadly, you know, the collaboration between just the fact that you have this panel sitting up here, it's from every different aspect of what it takes to get a company started and up and running. I mean, that collaboration and trying to look at things from different people's perspectives to make it work is, I don't, I don't think that happened, you know, five or ten yeah. years ago. And that in itself is a huge change. Yeah, no, I, I'd like to, I share the optimism of the panel. Obviously, um, from the city's gov city government's perspective, we are very bullish on the potential growth of this sector, but I also don't want to underestimate how hard this is. Um, the capital intensity, the time to market, the risk involved, particularly on the therapeutic side of um, from you know the timeline from having a piece of science that can potentially develop, be developed into a new drug to actually seeing that drug in the market through clinical t trials is very, very different from how entrepreneurship and startup works in a number of other sectors. And so I think you know one of the things we need to do, and we can talk more about this um, as the city in partnership with investors with real estate developers, with scientists, academics, um, and, and institutions is be really proactive about removing the barriers and reducing that risk so that we can have as many of these companies start and be successful here and get to market. Yeah, and we, we see that a lot. Um, you know, that this kind of science emerging from a university is incredibly early stage, and therefore it's about as early as you can get. It's often a really brilliant tech, uh, scientific insight and a paper and a patent maybe a couple of patents, and a f often, if you're lucky, a fantastic postdoc who's willing to go leave the university and join the company. Um, and so other, it's been an amazing run, just looking at it from Columbia's perspective. When I joined uh, 11 years ago, there were five or six patent-backed startups a year emerging from the university. In the last couple of years, we've had 20, 25, 28 every year. Um, but when people ask, what does it take to get these companies through that valley of death? The answer often has been everything. It, having a great patent is part of it. Having dynamic scientists and their graduate students is part of it. Having real estate, um, access to capital. Um, but, but I think the city has really done, uh, uh, under both the, the Bloomberg administration and the Blasio administration, has really uh, embraced that idea that there's uh, a, a huge number of hurdles that still remain and to do everything possible to, to, to minimize the impact of those hurdles. So maybe, Ewan, if you think back on the last, when did you join the New York City sort of economic development scene? So originally in 2008. 2008, right. Yeah. So over the last nine or 10 years, what have been some of the initiatives that you've seen uh, that you think across the city, whether it's from the, from the partnership for New York City or from the academic institutions or from our, our uh, investors or our real estate folks or the EDC, that you think have made a, a difference in the growth of the ecosystem here? So I think um, from the academic institutions, and I think Gordana referenced this, certainly some of the leadership and culture change that's happened, um, more focus on uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, um, more focus on helping companies to start here, helping investigators who are interested in becoming entrepreneurs and founders um, to follow that path, and, and leadership in the academic medical centers um, from, from the most senior levels um, to create a more collaborative environment has been hugely important. Um, 
we have seen the entry of more risk capital and more experienced risk capital because it's not just about the money, it's about the knowledge and the mentorship and the networks and connections that come with that money. So um, uh, people coming into the ecosystem here in New York and providing access to all of those things. We're seeing now significantly sized A rounds, which I don't think we saw really in the past. We certainly didn't see them in any kind of number. Um, clearly the development of, of lab space and, and life sciences space for companies, and I think that's going to be important going forward. Launch Labs is hugely important, having that space for earlier stage companies to then start and grow. And we've got to partner with the real estate industry to make sure we bring the right kind of space onto the market at the right time as the companies kind of uh, grow and expand. Um, and, and you, you referenced um, uh, Sam's project, which EDC was involved in, um, Harlem Biospace. So that those kind of spaces for the very earliest stage companies, I think, are, are also important. So it's really a combination of all of these things um, to build a cluster that's more mature um, over time. And one thing I would also add to that is I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that we're still in somewhat of uh, maybe the tail end of an inflection point where Big Pharma, for example, recognized maybe starting 10 or so years ago that being in these isolated clusters in distant lands or, or, or you know, places in New Jersey where they were by themselves in these cloistered communities really wasn't working out that well. I mean, it worked out up until that point. Then you started having huge patent expiries and they had slowed down in R&D and they really recognized, you know, there was this big sea change from those types of environments into major urban environments around major universities where the basic research was happening. And today, something like 75% of all new medicines, therapies uh, that, that uh, pharma companies are putting on the market came from research outside of their own labs. So the importance that we're in today of the, of the partnering of industry and, um, and, and the academic and medical centers is, is really important to recognize, and we have to do everything we can to, to really take advantage of that. And I think you know, everybody here is, is trying to do that, but I think if you recognize that as an important thing that's happening, and these are people that are looking to partner and make things happen and, and also help fund research, um, provide translational opportunities for the, some of the great basic research that's happening, uh, you really recognize here's the big picture and why are some of these other things happening and how do we facilitate more access to that? How do we make more things happen? Um, and I think that's an, just another important detail of where we are. So it sounds like people are pretty bullish on the status, New York City status today in this field, but would you say we're over the tipping point? Like at this point, is there, is there no return? Is New York ever going to catch up to Boston? Or, or if we're not at the tipping point, what could, what could trip us up? What are sort of the biggest risks that New York City still faces today? Well, I, I from our perspective at Alexandria, because we're in every other major science market, and as I said, New York is our most nascent, earliest cluster. Um, I'd say we're not at the tipping point yet. I mean, I think we've made tremendous strides as a community for all the reasons we've talked about here this morning. I think there's tremendous momentum. Uh, but the industry, I, I remember meeting seven, eight years ago with Elias Zerhouni, and he's the president of R&D at Sanofi, and uh, his office is in Paris, and he was formerly the head of the NIH also. And his perspective then was, look, and I, or excuse me, New York missed the boat 20 years ago, and they're trying to play catch up now. And he was amazed at what we've done. We had him and his entire you know, science team come in, and we did a, a pharma day and really introduced them to a lot of what was going on in the community, and they were blown away and have since then got more and more involved in the community. Um, but that fact that we have been playing catch up, that other places got kind of started first, and a lot of big companies went there, we have a tremendous amount of, you know, I think world-class institutions here, which is clearly the reason we're all sitting here today. I mean, that is the major driver of the life science industry. And what's happening at places like Columbia, you know, Mount Sinai, Sloan Kettering, Rockefeller, Weill Cornell, NYU, you know, go down the list. I mean, there's an incredible number of organ, you know, institutions here that really make it happen. But we still have a long way to go. I mean, I think the things that were lacking in our eyes and developing all these other science clusters uh, originally was lack of at-risk venture capital, which again is certainly improving. And thank you to groups like Deerfield uh, and several of the other ones that um, Warren mentioned earlier. 
management talent, another major issue. It's one thing to start companies and have great ideas and you need people to run them. It's not often the people who actually start it that know how to make it work from a business standpoint. So that is getting better and, and part of our hypothesis and at the Alexandria Center was bringing in some major companies like Roche, Lilly, Pfizer, and groups like that that bring a lot of seasoned talent with it and people have started you know, flaking off and, and working with a lot of the other uh, organizations. And Calliope is a great example. Uh, Nancy Thornberry, who is the CEO there, and, and Calliope, for those of you who don't know, was a, it's an uh, amazing startup out of Columbia, um, which uh, some of the top scientists in, in the world, in fact, not just New York, uh, are a part of that. Tom Anyatis being one, Charles Zucker, um, Richard, Axel. Richard Axel, so a yeah, really exciting company. Um, but their CEO was, a, a, from Merck, was with Merck for 30 years, um, and she's a very dynamic person. She did, had won a lot of awards and had a lot of uh, very credible things happen at Merck. So it's that marrying together of great science and, and, and these types of entrepreneurs that we really need to continue to see happen. You know, I think, um, I think from our perspective, the ultimate management talent for a great idea you're gonna, it'll come, right? If you have a fabulous idea, people are gonna recognize it and they're gonna come to it. So I think the stage that we think slightly more about is right before people recognize that it's a really great idea, because that's when it really needs a lot of nurturing and, and a lot of support. And from my perspective, I think that's more of the entrepreneurial um, talent. And, and that is in New York and we know that we have it, but I think a support network for that is still really important and very critical to have that grow because if you're in Boston, you can go to Starbucks and there are six other entrepreneurs sitting around the table and there's two venture, capital, venture capitalists sitting with them. We don't have that yet here. And I think um, you know, in two years or three years, will we have that kind of great support here? It's very likely. I mean, I think we're all really working very hard to make that happen here. Um, and I think part of what the city is doing is trying to build that type of community through their internship program and all of that. And I, I think um, as soon as we have that, then my personal opinion is we'll be beyond the tipping point and we'll be ready to go. Um, but I think fostering that, that one piece of it is, is really helpful. But you know, the management talent that you speak of is ultimately you know, the critical piece to the success of all of these companies. And I think just a little bit earlier than that is also very critical and we need to keep that in mind. I think to, to your point, just real quick, Nancy, who I mentioned from Calliope, she talks about the fact that they've been able to recruit from all over the world. People want to come to great companies, you know, and so I think you're right. Yeah. And one of the things that's really been, um, at least that, that I've seen from my perspective, is uh, having grown up here in New York, it feels like a very, very big city. I mean, it is a very big city, obviously, um, but it also feels like a very fragmented city in many ways. Uh, you've got Columbia and uh, City College and Einstein up here in the northern end. Along the East River Carter, you've got Mount Sinai, Sloan Kettering, Rockefeller, um, uh, NYU, um, and then you know SUNY Downstate out in Brooklyn. So it can feel very fragmented, especially when you're first um, entering this world. So if you're thinking about starting a company here in New York, it's a little bit hard to know where to turn. I think in some ways, one of the things that's been amazing to see about Columbia over the last five years is with the leadership of the, the deans of engineering and the medical center um, and SEPA with the launch of Columbia Entrepreneurship, um, the, the Columbia Entrepreneurship community has really come together to try and make that much easier to find the resources you need on campus. But Columbia is sort of a microcosm of the city at large. Um, do you feel like New York City has a clear biotech community at this point? And if not, what can we do to create that? I think it's, I think it's building, right? And I think, you know, we, as John said, I think we have momentum, we're not past tipping point. But I'm, I'm kind of slightly laughing because it's such a New York City thing to say, you know, only in New York would we say that places that are like three or four miles apart were, were fragmented, right? And I think part of what part of what you're actually alluding to is, you know, the, the, the advantage and the curse in some ways of New York is because we have so many different industries and clusters here. You know, like we're the media capital of the world. We're one of arguably three major global financial hubs. And so sometimes when you're in another sector, unlike being in a city where, you know, that's the only sector and that's the dominant thing in the city, it can feel fragmented. So I think we, we still have to do more to um, strengthen and promote that connective tissue between the institutions, between venture capital, risk capital, and, and, and startups and entrepreneurs. But I think all the ingredients are there, um, and we just need to continue to build it over time. So 
Gordana, I, I started with you, so I'm going to come back to you. Um, if you think about the road ahead, about with the companies you formed, uh, we're very proud of all of them, and we think they all will grow to be huge companies. Um, what would make you choose to stay in New York as they grow? And also, what might cause you to move some of them outside of New York as they grow? Yeah, actually, we've been thinking a lot about it. And uh, one of our three companies, the oldest one, which is still very young, but uh, the most advanced one, Epibon, had to move out of Manhattan, out of need. I mean, this is a regenerative medicine company. We need a GMP facility. We need a lot of square, like a number of square feet is would just make it prohibitively expensive, you know, to rent space on Manhattan. So they, they moved out. The other two companies are in Alexandria, and as we are moving to the next stage, we started to think seriously about what you just asked about. You cannot, it doesn't make any sense, for example, to make a large manufacturing facility on Manhattan. So our thinking at this time is that as we are developing this families of products. We will be just um, licensing them to others that may be somewhere else, but outside of the New York City. So we don't plan to ramp up production, but we plan to maintain this idea, identity of an R&D company, because I think this is probably the best possible profile that can take advantage of all the things that you are mentioning. The other aspect that we are thinking a lot about, and Colombia is just starting this initiative about engineering for humanity and world projects. So, like, thinking about sort of socially responsible projects, thinking about the projects that are less self-centric, not serving New York City or United States or just ourselves, but actually going out and doing something for humanity. I think this is part of the mission that this environment and the New York City can serve extremely well. And one factor is not only what you say, all ingredients are here, but also when you look at the New York population, it's the world in small. You know, you have like all kinds of groups of people. And when we think about addressing some of the underserved communities, you don't necessarily need to go out to Africa. Of course we go. But there are people next to us, you know, that could really greatly benefit from some of the developments. So this is where I see just being smart, economical about using resources, because we will always, always be limited with space in the first place, and then maybe a little bit less with some other resources. And we will always be able to capitalize on what is the greatest thing in New York, this critical mass of intellectual ability, different kinds of professions that are working together, different pieces that really need to come together yeah. to, to, to... That's a great point. Um, and I, I will mention, it's, it's really, it's exciting. Uh, I know from the students' perspective and from the faculty's perspective, um, part of this is about starting companies and creating you know, their careers, but part of it is about changing the world in a meaningful way. It's a really significant part of it, and especially for uh, for health-related startups. I mean, the mission is so clear. And so I think about um, whether it's, uh, you heard from Dean Jano earlier from the public, uh, from SIPA, or uh, Mary Boyce, the Dean of the Engineering School, uh, with her uh, hacking for Ebola and, and various sort of social challenges. I know that that gets the students and the faculty really motivated to try and make this work. And often companies emerge from those sort of organically, as opposed to having been the reason why people do it in the first place. And also, you know, related to that, I think there's a, a component or a player in the ecosystem where New York has an advantage that we'll see um, play a more significant role in the coming years, which is um, philanthropy and, and disease-focused um, and disease-specific investments from philanthropists, which I think we have the most enormous pool of philanthropy here in New York. It's a very sophisticated, developed ecosystem, and, and we'll see that play a bigger role. I, you know, I, I think it goes um, beyond just the philanthropic community. and. Um, so, you know, Deerfield number a couple of years ago started our Healthcare Innovations Fund, which is a, it's a fund dedicated actually to invest in early stage research. But what we've decided to do is take all the profits from that fund and put the profits into our foundation. So that means none of the partners make any money on that fund. It all goes directly to the foundation. And from that, we'll be investing in um, science that we believe is medically necessary, but not necessarily an investment type 
of things. So when you get, when you start speaking about programs like curing malaria, I mean, as much as we'd like that to be an investment, it, it, that's just not where the world is right now, but we understand and recognize the importance of that. And, and I think it goes back to the fact that this whole community is trying to be collaborative and really work together to make this work. And advancing healthcare from all of our perspectives is incredibly important. I mean, each, what each person is doing here is in fact doing that. Right, absolutely. I, I'm getting the signal that we're out of time, but I think it's worth noting that the, um, many of you may be surprised that a panel full of New Yorkers is talking about how collaborative a city this is and how we're all working together to get this done. But that is actually how it feels like um, on the ground. And we encourage you, if you'd like to learn more resources that are available for biotech entrepreneurship, um, probably the easiest thing to do just at a speed is sign up for our newsletter, Tech Ventures columbia.edu. There's events like this happening all over the city all the time, and we can help direct you in the right direction. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists for taking the time today.